Thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. So I will try to run you through my presentation, trying to make it as much as possible interactive. Uh, for those of you that attended the previous two lectures, uh, we are framing the work that we do into the energy transition. That was the first lecture. And then we are focusing in certain topics, and the second lecture was about the power system. So this is also where I'm focusing my work. I'm responsible for strategies for power system transformation. And uh, specifically today I will look at, a, let's say, a geographical focus, which is the islands. So why the islands are important? If you are following what is happening in COP in general, starting from, well, probably the first few COPs, but especially COP21 onwards, uh, things such as the 1.5 degrees target is something that is very much islands driven. Uh, so do you think, how many of you think that the reason why we are focusing on the energy transition of islands is for climate change mitigation? That's good news. And uh, maybe f something that could be uh, different from that. So maybe there are laboratories that can show how the energy transition could work for everybody. Do you think this is a reasonable proposition? No. Okay, then I'll try to give you my view and then we, we see if you agree or not. Hopefully not, so we can have a discussion. Well, if I can get to slide two. Okay, this is just the outline for our uh, series. So this is the third of this series. There is another four coming up over the next few weeks until the end of January. Uh, for those of you that didn't attend the previous one, just a couple of words about ARENA. We are an intergovernment organization, so we work for countries. We are, at the moment, we have pretty much global membership, 153 members and 27 states in the process of joining. So this is quite a global coverage. So we deal with issues that go from, of course, the islands all the way up to large power systems such as uh, in Germany, China, US, and so on. Uh, presentation will be split into two parts. Essentially, I'll try to make a problem statement, trying to describe the context of the energy transition in islands, which is quite a different context, if you allow me to say, uh, compared to the global energy transition picture. It has things that are very specific to islands and things that are very relevant for others as well, and they're happening much quicker than in other places. And that's why it's also very important to, to look at islands in this stage. Uh, and then I'll try to give an overview of what IRENA is doing in support of its island members to address some of these challenges. So, characteristics of the challenges for renewable energy deployment in islands. Uh, well, logistics. Uh, what is the longest time you spend from your departure from home to your destination in your life, in one of your holidays or for, for a duty travel. So you're going from A to B, what is the longest time that it took you to get to your destination? 24 hours? That's a, that's a long time, mostly by plane or, or by other means? Plane? 24. Where was it? Sorry? Where about? Where was the destination? Okay, so it was not actually 24 hours of flying time, but there were layovers. Yes, long way. Well, uh, most of these places could be reached in uh, less than 24 hours, but others might take a week. And so the question is, what does it mean we were talking about bringing equipment out there? Uh, some other logistic challenges might not be as relevant to renewable energy, but there are certainly uh, logistic challenges with the size and the isolation of some of these places. Local capacity in a small place, of course, it's a smaller playground, so that there will be experts, but probably a smaller number than you would have in Germany. Uh, and the power system is quite peculiar, and it really depends on the scale. So when we're talking islands, we're talking very, very small islands, all the way up to fairly large islands, and I will try to give a flavor of that in the next few slides. Transportation is also unusual, so a lot of the work that that you do in transporting goods nowadays, thank you, is on, uh, well, to, to a large extent in, in continental system is on uh, road by trucks, but there is also a large component of rail in some countries, while in the islands is typically shipping for obvious geographical reasons, and that has energy implications which are significant for goods, 
And when you're talking about, of course, flying in an expert, uh, the, the cost of a very long flight typically is much higher than the cost uh, of a very local flight like could be in Europe. So everything has a much higher transaction cost. So there's also positive sides of it. Part of the PowerPoint is not displaying correctly. What I'm trying to show in this slide is that if you look at a warm-up, which is a little bit difficult to read, uh, you notice that probably the majority of the world has a share of tourism in their exports that is below 10%. Well, islands typically are an attractive tourism destination, so typically in, in the imaginary of people, an island is this paradise place with uh, palm trees and beautiful sea, and everything is good, and uh, you don't need electricity because you're just there for holiday. If you're not there for holiday, the situation is a bit different, but a lot of people go there for holiday. So we are reaching almost 90% of the exports of some countries being tourism, which means typically you have to bring in air conditioning, water desalination, and other energy needs. But you also get foreign currency. On the other end of the spectrum, you might not have these energy challenges, but you also don't have the income that tourism brings. So point of this slide, well, uh, islands are all different. And when you try to cluster them and say, oh, the Pacific Islands, we, it's a small place. If you look at one by one, we put them all together and we do a project for all of them. This will never work. Because of political reasons, but not only, also because the islands are really very different. And this is to give you an idea. So this is the size of the power system of uh, many islands. Let's say going from tens or hundreds of kilowatts all the way up to here you see a bit larger ones, which are in the tens of megawatts. What does it mean? So essentially, the most remote places, I will show you some pictures of those, I'll try to focus a little bit on the smaller places, are extremely small. When you talk about big islands, you still talk about relatively small places, with some exceptions. So again, to the point that uh, islands are all different, it means you need to have horses for courses, you need to have an approach that is tailored to the country you're working with and larger systems go up, and you consider large system close to 100 megawatt. Um, do you know how large is the power system in Germany? Okay, I know you know, but you don't want to answer. It's around 65,000 megawatt peak demand at the moment, so if the big ones here are in the 80, uh, well, Germany is 65,000. Interestingly, we are working with some of the so-called small island developing states at the moment, which are in the thousands as well. So it's not all like this. There are some of the islands that are one, two, three, four thousand uh, megawatt peak demand. But the majority, if you count them one by one, are in this very small range. But again, if you have a solution for this, it will not work for the one at thousand plus megawatts. So again, some of the challenges I mentioned before. The cost of logistics could be higher. If you think the projects are small, it's even higher. Availability of infrastructure. If you want to put up a, a windmill in Germany, you have abundant infrastructure, starting from transportation to, to say, cranes to lift the, the, the tower. Well, that is not always the case. And uh, also having the ability of designing such systems is abundant in some countries, but when the country is smaller, it's a bit more challenging. And again, when you talk about power system, which is typically a bit of focus at the moment, when we say the energy transition, we mean everything, but when we really see what's happening is power, and this is true in the islands as it is true globally, when you say power, you're saying solar and wind at the moment. And if you talk islands, you're really saying solar, with some exception that we will see, but essentially we have a semantic problem. We talk about energy transition, we are talking electricity transformation, and once you go a bit deeper into that, we are talking about variable renewables, solar and wind. And that's why we are raising challenges that are specific to solar and wind as a problem for renewables, which is a misconception. There is a problem with its own solutions for certain renewables in certain systems. This is not a general statement. As a general statement, it's false. As a specific statement, especially in islands, it's true but solution exists and they've been implemented as we speak. Environment, couple of points there. Your technical standards or your equipment that works very well in Germany will rust very quickly in an island. Uh, some of the equipment that will work pretty well throughout the year because of temperature will have problems if it's exposed to high temperatures throughout the year, which means you really need to think about, this is a small market, but you cannot try to apply what works in Germany to a tropical 
corrosive environment because it will fail. And finally, it's crucial to understand that this is a small ecosystem. If you bring in fuel and you spill the fuel, there is a big damage that can go all the way up to the larger economy affecting tourism. But also if you bring in, say, batteries, you want to make sure that you have a plan to take them out once their life is, is exhausted. This is not a big issue, but you need to think about it in the planning stage because to transport them out might be quite expensive and if you don't put the money aside, you will not be able to do it and you're trying to solve an issue while you're creating another. Then trying to get to the more illustrative part of the presentation, so what does logistics mean in very small remote places? Well, this is your best chance of getting something to shore. Well, actually there is a reef, so you're not getting it to shore, you're getting it on something like this. Once you're getting it in something like this, sometimes it falls in the water. But if it doesn't, you need to find somebody that has been not made aware of how heavy is this equipment. So my favorite quote from a very wise colleague of mine from those days, when I asked him, how do you convince people to lift these batteries? They weigh 250 kilos apiece. And it's like, it's very simple. Just don't tell them how heavy they are. They'll pick it up. So there are challenges that human ingenuity can solve, but, uh, but they're indeed challenges. I'm not going to be able to lift 250 kilos, even if you don't tell me. But somebody clearly is doing it. So there are solutions, but they might not be the typical solution that you see in the two standards on how to do properly a project. So you need to be a bit more uh, creative sometimes with solutions. But at the end, you get your systems in place, so you think you're done. Well, sometimes. So this was August 2013, a uh, month before commissioning. Uh, less than two years later, something happened. And this is what is left. So, well, you discount your investment for 20, 25 years. But unfortunately, climate change is increasing the frequency of such events. And as you've been reading in the news for the Caribbean, that's also a common occurrence in the Pacific. And this is becoming more and more frequent. So one of the big questions, if you put equipment out there, how do you make sure it's going to last you your 20 years? And well, there is not really an easy answer. But certainly not thinking about it doesn't really yield brilliant results. So this is a little bit about the, the context, the logistics, and the supply. Uh, Let's look a little bit at the demand. So what is that is needed? Well, there is a list of items here that I will try to illustrate a little bit going through pictures rather than, than bullet points. But essentially, the needs are almost the same. It's just that they might have a different weight in terms of how important they are. So if you're talking about tourism, 50% is air conditioning, typically in a tropical island. So you need to take into account that that happens typically during the heat of the day, so you might have a very good match with solar, but essentially you have to again look case by case. Lighting, what does it mean? Well, lighting has different qualities, so when we discuss energy access in, in the broader terms, once you have light, it doesn't mean you have your energy needs uh, for that specific use properly met. Then if you start going up, you can get kerosene lanterns, it's very expensive and not very healthy, but it's a bit more light. Renewables not only bring you a better economic case and a better environmental case, but in many cases bring you a better quality of service, which is very important. Energy services are at the end what you want, it's not the kilowatt hour that you're using. So clearly this light is superior, it is cheaper, it's uh, better for the environment, so there are very significant gains in terms of quality of life and quality of service in the first steps of the energy transition. If you go to the next step, then you're thinking about larger scale, so what is the next big thing? Well, probably health and education, and so you want to make sure that you have a, a bit more of a systematic approach to how to extend these services to everyone. These are solar lanterns that are charged at the school and taken on by the children. Uh, these are street lights, again, solar street lights. You don't need to build a power grid if you don't really need one, because you could have generation and service in the same place. And, and so on and so forth. Cooking, again, depends what you mean. There is a traditional part of cooking. All of us like to do barbecue in summer. Uh, a solar cooker probably will not do it. So there is a cultural part of it, but there's also a more functional part of it, which is not ideal. And certainly, you don't want to build a solar system to cook with this thing. So challenges certainly remain. There are different solutions. Uh, somehow, to a certain extent, a better way of doing barbecue might be a smart solution, 
but uh, probably this goes a little bit too much into the details, but this is uh, not electricity necessarily. What I'm trying to say is that solar and wind is the mainstream, but maybe you don't want to use solar and wind to power this, but you want to find a better way to use your coconut husk, for instance, for cooking. So improved cook stoves could go a long way without having to electrify every single sector. Cooling, again, the same idea. Cooling could be something extremely energy intensive and extremely inefficient at the same time. But at the same time, it could be something more simple. If you design your buildings properly, so again, energy efficiency and renewables go always together. In a climate where you don't need heating, if you have a touch roof uh, and a ceiling fan, it could probably give you a better service than this. This is probably 50 watt, and this is uh, around 500 in the best case. And, and I can guarantee you, if the building is not insulated, this is not really useful. It's just noisy, expensive, and it doesn't really go very far. So again, thinking about efficiency and, and the broader context helps you identify appropriate solutions. Refrigeration as well is a big need, and that's another energy intensive use. And this is one of the things you need to plan for in advance, because we take it for granted, but I can guarantee you not always is taken for granted. If you size your system not taking into account such needs, then you might be surprised that it's insufficient. Going a bit more into the supply side of things, so power generation in islands, how does it look like? So this is your baseline. Uh, diesel generators have been the, the normal way of providing electricity in islands, up to very large scales. There are large diesel generators operating at 25 megawatt a, a unit in islands at the moment, quite efficient, and smaller ones, not so efficient, been operating in the few kilowatt scale. So solutions exist, but the traditional way is a sim single technology, diesel into an internal combustion engine that creates electricity. So we talk about transition in the electricity sector starting from a pretty common baseline. So most islands have this as the baseline and solar as the new solution. And so you need to make sure that this will be a transition that is quite smooth. You can either redesign the system from scratch or you can start introducing gradually renewables, but you need to have a plan. This is the the main takeaway. This has been working for a hundred years. Solar is relatively new, wind as well, so you need to make sure that everybody knows how to operate the system with these new technologies and that they're integrated properly, having a plan in mind of where you're heading. When you have off-grid solutions, this is relatively simple because you're not going from diesel to increasing shares of renewables, you're just designing a system. So systems such as this are designed from scratch you can optimize already everything in the design phase, you procure it, you install it, and you have pretty reliable uh, power supply if you did the job properly. And this has been quite common in many areas to the point that now in more remote areas, not only in islands, but also say in sub-Saharan Africa, these solutions are cheaper than bringing the grid there. Especially if the, the scale of the demand is small, more and more the decreasing cost of renewables makes the solutions such as this, so off-grid, mini-grid, standalone facilities, as the preferred solution from an economic perspective, not only from an environmental perspective. Wind generation, similarly, there's much less uh, wind deployment because of some of the infrastructural challenges. However, wind has been around for quite a bit. This technology here has been uh, invented, I think, in 1815, if I'm not mistaken, in Tuscany and it's been uh, seen in all the western movies in, in uh, rural areas of the US during the 19th century, this was the way to pump water. There's no electricity, but if the need is water, you don't need to go through electricity. Modern wind looks a little bit different. This is the commissioning of the Gorona del Viento system in Aliero. This is the first uh, so-called 100% renewable island system where wind and hydropower work together to provide electricity without having the need to keep thermal units such as uh, diesel generators running. So some parts of the year this wind is blowing, generating electricity, any excess electricity gets pumped into a hydro reservoir, a small lake up on the mountain, and then when there is a need for additional generation that the wind can omit, the hydropower plant is doing that thanks to the electricity stored by the wind. This is one of the configurations we will look at some more later, but uh, the idea is that there are a lot of possibilities for an energy transition and each island and each jurisdiction in general has its own resources and should make use of those. Uh, hydropower. Uh, I used to have this slide two years ago when I presented again in this uh, setting saying hydro, good option. 
but unavailable on many islands. Now, the more you go ahead, probably the more people would tell you is best because there is a, a kind of a resurgence of hydro, hydro as the best storage solution because when you go to large share of variable renewables such as solar and wind, you start needing more and more storage. And if you think about storage, how many of you think batteries? How many of you think about hydrogen? How many of you think about pumped hydro? And that's 99 point something percent of storage nowadays is hydro, pumped hydro. Very large systems building on existing generation that become all of a sudden storage for you. However, challenges exist. So this system has been built in the 80s. It was giving 70% of the electricity to one island. Then the demand started growing, the capacity of maintaining the system started decreasing, people retired, people left the island, and this was the status of this repair. You just needed to try a few times until finally managed to find somebody willing to come out there to do a good job and turn that into this again. So ideally, Hydro has been around for a long time, but to make sure that this keeps running and providing you the majority of your electricity and potentially part of your storage, in some of the islands has been a challenge. Again, it's a matter of scale. This is a few megawatt system, five, six megawatt system. Larger systems such as Fiji, they have hundreds of megawatts of hydro and there is no such a challenge. They have tens of people that can manage the system. But this was out of service for 10 years. Think about how much diesel has been burned for 10 years because of this system not being operating. And it's, it's quite significant and you think it would be a no-brainer, but uh, can guarantee you it took some time. So, summary, pathways. So we talk a lot about uh, pathways for the energy transition. So, of course, from IRENA perspective, these are the icons that we use in our uh, official publications and, and communication materials. This is essentially five of the six renewables. There is a sixth that I will talk about, but let's say each of them is one of the six uh, re category of renewable resources, and each of them has a place in the energy transition. So. First obvious starting point, if you don't have the resource, well, I think you should just go to the next one. But if you don't have any of the easy ones, you still have some. Everybody has sun, everybody has wind, to a different extent. Therefore, you really need to, to look at the transition as something that starts from your starting point, yours as an island, as a government, as an institution. What are your resources? What are your constraints? What can you do with what you have? And try to make the best out of it. So, Hydropower, well, there's been systems of any size that have been running on hydropower forever. If you have uh, an atoll in the Maldives with one meter elevation on the sea level, I don't think you can do much with hydropower. You're lucky if you can have enough drinking water, so that is not an option for you. But there are other options. Biofuels, uh, most of the talk is about coconut oil for diesel generation. This is the perception. The reality is there is a large sugarcane industry which has a byproduct which is called bagas, which is 99.9% .9 of bioenergy generation in islands. So everybody has something in mind when you say bioenergy in islands. Again, the, the, the tropical island with coconut trees. The reality is large sugarcane plantation in some islands do the bulk of the job. And that's been around for hundred and something years. Uh, geothermal. Brilliant uh, renewable energy resource available in some islands. If to keep in mind that if you dig a hole to find your resource, it should be well well placed. So you need to make sure you're not gonna miss the resource, but you might miss the resource. So on average, a hole costs a million or so. If your electricity cost is a million per year, you can dig three holes, and this will cost you like three years of electricity supply. So you understand that the scale issue is significant there. You could do a lot with geothermal, but uh, well, if you have a bigger system, your holes will be in proportion much less costly. If you have a small system, well, good luck. There are risk mitigation facilities, but you still have to keep in mind that you cannot kill mosquitoes with a cannon and you have your own pathway based on your resources, your geography, your size. And finally, solar and wind. The more you look at this too, the more you have things to say because this is what everybody is talking about nowadays and because this is the deployment that is happening today. All new renewables deployment has been solar and wind to a large extent, a bit more hydro, 
but Hydra has been around forever. Solar and wind have been deployed rapidly only in the last decade. So what can you say about solar and wind? Well, in terms of pathways, uh, there's two things that you need to think about. Uh, one is that they require changes. It's a new system. When you introduce new things into a system, people need to learn how to manage them. So I'm not going to say anything more about it because that was the topic of last lecture. So my colleague Francisco spoke about it. So you need to change your oper operational procedures. But also you need to keep in mind that some additional equipment might be needed. And this is needed especially in small systems because you don't have the luxury of balancing your solar and wind over a continent, over a large transmission system, but you have to balance it in real time from a relatively small jurisdiction with no interconnection to the outside world. So essentially, there's a few acronyms there. This is pump hydro storage, battery energy storage system, demand side management, flywheels, thermal storage, power to X, and so on and so forth. So storage is a big family. It's a very hot topic, and uh, we are working quite actively at the moment on this topic because it's been quite prominent. Uh, and again, we're talking storage, but everybody has in mind batteries. That's more to storage than batteries, but again, there is something that has been around forever, and there's something that's quite new which is on a learning curve becoming cheaper and cheaper, and the modularity of solar and batteries makes it a brilliant solution for islands, while in a larger system you might have a much better chance with a large pumped hydro system with large hydro resources to get to your large share of renewables. So again, nowadays we have solution for every single size. You can go from making 100% renewable school to making 100% renewable country just by adding more of the same solar modules inverters and storage systems. It's all coming down to planning and to take a look at how this system could operate is also important. A couple of words about transport. It's not all about power. Transportation in islands used to be 100% renewable. It's fish-based, so you have your meal and then your paddling, or wind-based. I mean, transportation by sea has always been 100% wind power until we invented internal combustion engines and that changed. These are the internal combustion engines working today with a significant burden on the people. The cost of running these large machines is a significant burden to the local economy but is somehow at the moment without any alternatives unless you want to go back to this. And as much as you can try to do carpooling and sharing your resources, they're still an inefficient outboard engine being used that consumes significant amounts of fuel for a local economy. The other thing that was discussed already at the beginning, the way to get there for goods is by sea, for people is by air. Again, it's not the most cost efficient way, it is a significant burden for a local economy, but you really cannot go there by road. And, of course, the, the implications here is that you have fuel oil being burned in significant quantities and you have aviation gasoline and jet kerosene being burned in significant quantities with no real alternatives at the moment on the horizon. And then on land, of course, you can talk about uh, your latest Tesla model, but uh, the, the, the affordability issue is an important one. So some people just walk, some other people can share a pickup truck, and as you can see, sharing goes a long way but there is still gasoline or diesel being burned in there. There's been some uh, testing with uh, biofuels, that's also an option, but we all hope that in all islands that can afford it at least, electric vehicles will be a game changer, but that might require some time as the, the second end market picks up because there's hardly any new sales in the smaller jurisdictions. And then, uh, well, there's something else that is very important for islands. Uh, one of them is communication, which is really changing the lives of people and requires a little amount of energy. But again, the first kilowatt hours really go a long way in increasing the quality of lighting, the impact of lighting for education, communication. But going from zero to something sometimes is not happened yet. There's a lot of uh, more remote places with no access to electricity, which means no access to high quality lighting, safe lighting, and good communication. And of course, the IT infrastructure. That's a thing called digital divide. Well, you cannot really operate a laptop without electricity. They are now much more efficient than the old desktop computers, but if you wanna have your children being able to use a computer or, or a my mobile phone, you need to be able to charge it. And that seems obvious, but if you're looking at the most remote places, well, that's not happened yet. Some of the 
more remote areas, for instance in the Pacific, they have uh, electricity access as low as uh, 10%. Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands in particular, they have the largest population and the lowest electricity access. And desalination, we did some work at IRENA in the past looking at renewable energy solutions for desalination. This is a significant need. Not everywhere you have sufficient rainfall. So what you need to keep in mind is that there are extremely renewable solutions that might not be the most reliable, but this is simply a black box with a piece of glass on top that works quite fine if you have a good sunny day and produces a few gallons or a few liters a day of uh, fresh water, which goes a long way. Or you can do something like this that probably will make your small electricity system collapse if you didn't plan for it, because distilling water is significant in terms of electricity consumption. So this is concluding the first part about setting the scene. I've been focusing on the smaller end of the islands issues. Of course, there is a continuum, as we've seen in the, in the maximum power system capacity chart. You go from a few kilowatts all the way up to a few million kilowatts, so gigawatts. And this is still considered small island developing states, so there's a universe of differences in there. And then, of course, when you're getting on the higher end of the spectrum, you're really already bigger than some of the non-island countries, and so you're starting sharing some of the issues. So. Before I go into the second part, which is about what ARENA is doing to assist its island members, do you have any questions, clarifications, uh, disagreements? Especially if you don't agree with something, it would be really useful to, to know it now so that I can make sure that when we talk about what we do, we see if we are really covering everything. It would be useful also for us to, to see how we are framing the issues. Yeah, just repeat the question for, for a video. So, what do you think about big battery system being built such as in, uh, in Hawaii at the moment? So, well, this is something that is already happening while we are thinking about if it's good or bad or the way to go. And, and I tend to believe that if things are happening, that makes sense because somebody is putting some millions into it. So, the idea is how much do you really need? And, and the answer is how cheap they are. So, we just released a report on the cost outlook for batteries that looks at another 66% potential reduction in cost in the next 10 years, 15 years. And, and the idea there is that a lot of the, the conceptions we have about solar are now applying to batteries. So at the beginning, solar was like, well, this is just for charging your mobile, but you cannot really do productive activities with solar. Well, now that some, uh, some of the people coming to our event on Sunday will show us you can weld on an off-grid solar system. Same thing with batteries. Well, they're very expensive, you don't really need many of them. It's like, no, you don't need many, but if you are in a very remote system with large, good resource, then you might use many. They might be the low, lowest cost solution. So the short answer is you need increasingly more batteries as you get more solar and wind into the system, but it still remains probably the least cost system as the cost of technology goes down. So you can put much more solar now and be able to spill and waste a little bit of it without having an economic problem. And the same is slowly becoming with batteries. So American Samoa is another project of the same kind where you're trying to do 90 plus percent with solar and batteries and, and not really worrying too much about excess capacity because at the end it's still cheaper than what you had before. So short answer, this is the way to go, and as the economics get better, this will become mainstream. Thank you for your presentation. I have two questions. The first one is related, you mentioned at the beginning, some issues related to the efficiency, energy efficiency. How do you consider, for example, new trends with new materials for the buildings, for example, regarding insulation uh, issues? Because I know there are new uh, Iceland, there are other new materials for the construction in order to reduce the energy consumption. Are you taking into account these problems or these new solutions? 
Well, two parts of answer. So from a global perspective and a transition, we, we just released some work on the synergies between energy efficiency and renewables. So essentially, if you're trying to tackle the energy transition and, and tackle decarbonization, you need to have efficiency being rolled out together. If you're looking at some of these uh, more remote places, the solutions that you devise, say, in, in US and continental Europe, are to solve a different problem. So essentially we have mostly a heating problem, which is significant for the energy transition, which we can do in different ways, uh, heat pumps being one of them. There is a lot about cooling there. So the question is, when you start introducing cooling, then your building that was designed for natural ventilation and having very little insulation is the worst possible building you have. So the building that has been designed for, for centuries out there for Natural ventilation is a non-insulated building, it's pretty much open. Once you start building air conditioning units into this building structures, you have a significant problem. And if you think about the humidity in some of these places, the problem becomes even more significant <laughs> because cooling doesn't really like too much humidity. So the, the problem is that when you talk about energy efficiency, you have, a, again, a mindset of Europe-US solutions, so the zero emission houses, it's not the same kind of zero emission houses you need out there. And these things typically have a high upfront cost while the building stock is quite cheap. So when you start mixing more and more cooling demand and the same building stock, you have a recipe for disaster. So electricity demand spikes up and uh, you would have to rebuild the, the housing system, which is a bit complicated. It's already difficult to convince the tourism sector to consider these issues because they have a di direct impact on their revenues, but the normal uh, office buildings and, and accommodation really needs to think about energy efficiency once you're moving along the transition. The way is not to put more solar, to put more air conditioning to go out of the window, but to, to try to reduce the needs as well. You had a second question. Yeah, but the second one related to the regulation, privacy regulation of the service. I think there's a big problem if you consider, for example, wind and solar energy there. Uh, if I understand correctly, so the question about frequency regulation and reserves is, is typically one of these issues that you see in larger systems with the incremental deployment of variable renewables. You get more solar, more wind, you need more reserves to keep the, the system operating reliably. Once you talk about some of the smaller systems, you actually have a much better proposition, which is you turn off your thermal systems and you have your battery system generate the signal that gives you the 50 hertz or the 60 hertz. So if you look at the reliability and the power quality in some of the smaller systems that run without thermal generation, the best way to go is really to look at uh, having your battery system as your energy uh, master, so your grid master, and grid forming inverters typically give a much better quality of service to the electric appliances than small, poorly maintained diesel generators. So you have a much better proposition redesigning the system and having the battery system at the center of it, not the diesel generator. So you move the generator on the side and it's your charger. You have solar as your main source or wind where you have it. And then the battery is your grid master. That's why batteries are mostly deployed at the moment for, for very visible projects in islands. You mentioned Hawaii, but there's many out there at the moment. And this is a much better proposition for a smaller system. Now, if you want to switch the whole uh, European interconnected system to battery-centric uh, grid forming, that's a completely different problem. It's been started, but uh, it's a bit more down the line. For islands, it's very, very simple. Some of the pictures you saw, the one destroyed by the typhoon, I designed that in 2012 and has been operating reliably until the typhoon and has been rebuilt after that. This is a very simple system. It's a battery bank. You have uh, grid forming inverters, and there's no diesel there. And uh, well, the, the quality of power is outstanding compared to what they had before. Okay, then I move into the Irina solutions that has been built over the last, let's say, five years, five six years, trying to address the needs of of the islands. So islands have been very vocal and very prominent supporters of IRENA since its inception. IRENA is a bit more than six years old, so it's a relatively young organization, one of the youngest intergovernmental organizations. And at the very beginning, islands have been very 
strong supporters of the agenda and they've been asking for solutions that they haven't got until then in their renewable energy space. And so we develop a series of initiatives, tools, products and services to assist them. So I'll try to run you through all of them under the umbrella of what is our leading initiative, which is called the Seeds Lighthouses Initiative. Uh, so what is the Seeds Light Assist Initiative? Well, uh, we will have uh, an event to discuss that on Monday, a COP for those of you that have access to the bond zone, but in a few words, it's a partnership where small and developing states, governments come together with development partners and try to find solutions together. It's been launched uh, in the context of climate discussion, so the Secretary General Climate Summit in September 2014 in New York and uh, it has an objective to really enable the energy transition in Ireland. So what we've been talking today at a more high level as an umbrella for the work that we do together with many partners. So what is that we aim to achieve in uh, the first five years of the initiative? Well, alpha billion dollars mobilized for supporting renewable deployment in islands, 100 megawatt of new solar PV, 20 megawatt of wind, and significant additional other renewables such as hydropower, geothermal, and some ocean energy projects, at least at this stage as pilots. Just a word about ocean energy, that was the one missing in the list. It's not missing by chance because it's coming, but we don't want to talk about planning when we have high uncertainties. So what is happening there is that this has been tested and it's been pushed very much by the islands that have the resource. So tropical islands have very good ocean resources for obvious reasons and technologies have been developed. So the idea is that at this stage the objective is not to get a certain amount of megawatt in your power system because you're not sure yet about performance and cost. The idea is to make them work and to start deploying them, learning how to make them more reliable and then scale up the deployment. So at the moment these are certainly on the radar. We have been working on those as well. We have several publications on ocean energy. I didn't mention it in there because I think that planning is already a very uncertain business. If you start having high uncertainty in the input, then your output uh, doesn't have much significance. So you should plan with what you have and what you know and what you're sure about. Having very big question marks that completely skew your analysis is not a good practice for planning. But again, planning was the last lecture, so I'm not going to say anything more about it. And uh, last point, of course, because I say planning, is to ensure that all participants in this initiative have a renew renewable energy roadmap, which is essentially a plan, and I will say some words about it later. Uh, not to read, this is just a list of partners. The idea is that there is around 50 partners, of which more than 50 partners, of which 36 are small and developing states and 19 are a mix of intergovernmental organization, countries, and uh, NGOs, and even private sector. This is what we talk about when we say partners of the initiative, so the dots represent where they are located. As you can see, uh, it's essentially three areas of the world. One is called Caribbean, one is called Pacific, and one is called AIMS, which stands for Africa, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean, and South China Sea mouthful, but essentially it's non-Caribbean, non-Pacific, and it's this central area here. So these partners, as we mentioned before, have quite diverse needs, but they have some common key drivers, and of course climate change is one of them, renewable energy is another one of them that goes together with it. So how are we doing in the first three years of the initiative? Well, essentially this is where renewable energy stands in islands. Uh, in general, there are large islands that give the majority of this contribution, as you can probably not see, because the legend has been moved down here. Uh, the very large component here is essentially hydropower, which has been there for a bit already, it's nothing new. And uh, when you look at the additional deployment that has taken place since the start of the initiative, you see that you're, we're doing quite well. We said 120 plus some, and we are already well beyond that. So what is that we have deployed in the last three years? Solar PV. Unsurprising. Target was 100 megawatt. We are already beyond that. Wind. Target was 20. We are almost there. Uh, well, a bit more than 50%. There's been some additional hydro. You go quickly with just one project up, so it might be that next year we have another very large bar for hydro. And 
bioenergy. And as I mentioned before, this is not a thousand small uh, coconut oil generators. This is three large projects in Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Fiji, which have the upper end of this uh, scale of size of power system, where quite rapidly a couple of projects can make a big difference. And again, it's sugarcane by gas. So this is the umbrella. This is the initiative under which we work with islands, for islands, together with partners. And these are some of the tools that are available for islands and beyond uh, to assist. So I will go through some of them, uh, not all of them, but the idea is that we try to look from very high level what are the challenges on the institutional framework that remain to accelerate deployment of renewables, where should we focus our attention, and advising islands and partners on where would be good to focus the attention, that's called the quick scan. National energy roadmaps for islands, you need to have a plan before you start implementing it. Sometimes it's good to start implementing, but typically we can all share horror stories of when you start doing something before you thought about how this is going to end up. So please, let's have a plan. Grid studies for islands, uh, this has been presented last time. Just a couple of words of why this is the sequence that I am discussing because this is probably the sequence where you should be looking at uh, your transition, and these are some of the tools that Irina put in this sequence to assist in this process. So a grid study, typically you start getting renewables into the system, and then somebody comes and says there is a problem with uh, frequency stability. And somebody else says, well, I don't know anything about it because it's complicated, but I trust you, and so I stop deploying renewables. So what Irina has been doing is to bridge this communication gap and say, listen, this is certainly a challenge, there are solutions, let's look at it together, let's devise the solutions and let's continue deploying renewables. And that has been done for many islands and that has been presented last time, so I will not go into the details. Project Navigator, uh, one of the areas we identified as a challenge is in islands as in many other places, the difficulty of getting good projects to the banks. So the banks say, we have money and the countries say we have projects and then they tell you well the projects are not that good really I'm not going to finance them and you start talking about how do we bridge the gap and so the way that we have to do that for many technologies and many different type of countries is called Project Navigator and I have a few slides later where do I deploy my projects we have a, a global atlas that looks at renewable energy resources around the world with the GIS system and that goes down all the way to try to give you site-specific information to, to get an idea of where you should deploy your renewables. Uh, once you have your projects developed, you need to get to the financing institutions. How do we do that? Through the Sustainable Energy Marketplace. Again, I'll say a few words. And additionally, we've been supporting together the Abu, with the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development the actual implementation of some projects. So we are not an implementation organization. We don't do projects on the ground, we don't build power systems, we advise governments on, on everything renewables. In this specific case, we advise the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development on some projects that have been financed and have been installed. And then, of course, we have some more high-level policy support that applies to many different countries, including islands such as the Renewable Readiness Assessment and REMAP, which was presented in the first lecture. So, the rest of my presentation will just focus on these uh, tools, just saying a few words about each of them. I will not certainly have the time or the ambition to go into the details, but just to give a, a brief overview of what are they about. I hope that with this initial slide and discussion I gave an idea of how they fit. I hope that we are covering all the key needs, but again, uh, up for discussion. So how do we do that? Quick scan. This complicated chart simply tries to say that if you want to get renewables deployed, you need to take a look at different potential barriers at different levels. So you need to have an enabling policy environment, you need to have a, somehow an energy market, which means many different things to different people, and especially at different scales. You need to have regulations in place. Again, it could be very simple, very complicated, but you need to have some sort of regulation. For instance, you need to know what equipment you can connect to the system, what you cannot connect. You need to have an idea of how the plan is going to roll out, so have a plan. You need to have an idea of how you're going to finance your plan. And then you need to get projects, because without projects you don't get deployment. So essentially, you need to have a knowledge base to inform all these steps. 
and you need to have of course capacity and possibly some support. So how are we doing uh, in the enabling conditions that we need for this transition? This is just a, a ranking from an analysis that we did together with the countries and essentially here you have uh, the dark blue that means that these areas are ready. The light blue is in progress and the gray is still uh, lagging behind. So essentially some areas are doing much better than others and so some countries are doing much better than others but what we try to do there is to identify where the gaps are. And this has been done country by country so that we can look at it from an individual country perspective, from a specific topic, from a region. So you can look at it in many ways. So this is per country and this is per topic, which I think is probably more interesting. So everybody has good friends that are willing to help. So the idea of having partners is key and that is in place. Plans are being developed, uh, not everybody has a plan yet, which is concerning, but this is progressing quite well. Then the next, so this is ranked in, in order of what's doing better and what is doing worse. Knowledge base, information is there, but trust me, data is scarce and good data is needed for good planning. Especially if you want to go into the details and do a grid study, you need a significant amount of detailed data and that's probably missing in most places, so you have to start by building a knowledge base. And then the institutional framework, which is also very important, so who is doing what in the country, what are the responsibilities, is everything being addressed. Deployment is more about on the project side, so that's also a little bit like the institutional framework is progressing well, but it's not there yet. And uh, capacity building and financing seem to be the two big issues that we always hear about but we found out by looking item by item indeed are big challenges having skilled personnel to take care of all the different aspects of this energy transition and having access to finance which doesn't mean that the money is not there it means that the money is going to be given to you which is different from the money is there it means you need to have a plan you need to have a project and the project has to be bankable and so these two areas are a key concern So going to the next step, renewable energy roadmaps, we did quite a few for very diverse countries from a few megawatt to a few gigawatt uh, size. We are doing ongoing work uh, with some of the larger ones at the moment, uh, trying to go a bit more into a complex system and of course the, the, the complexity of the analysis increases accordingly, but the key point is that we've been working with the countries and with the national experts to assist with the planning process and not just developing a document. There is a lot of documents that suggest how the others should be doing uh, for their energy transition. That's a fundamental problem there. Nobody likes to be told how to do their things. It's additionally, probably I know better how to do my things than somebody else from outside. So the main point is that all this work has been done with the countries, trying to understand what are the issues and that's why they all look significantly different. So you cannot really apply the same approach and copy and paste to different countries. You really need to understand what are the key issues and they are very different no matter what you can try to say is a commonality between them. So transition planning again is a very serious job. It has to be done with the countries and has to take into account the local specificities. How does it look like? There is a request, Irina is an intergovernmental organization. So we receive requests from member countries for assistance. We sit down together and define the scope of work and that already you realize that the questions behind something called a roadmap are very diverse. And so once you define a scope of work, you know exactly what you're tackling. Then we do the analysis together with the national experts. We try to disseminate and discuss with the experts and the different stakeholders the results. And then finally you have the report which is typically produced in every project. It's just that, yeah. Having everybody reading all the reports produced nowadays is typically not the way to enable an energy transition, but you need to record what you found out by working with the people. So this is just a necessary evil, but essentially it is not the, the objective. The objective is to make sure that we understand what are the needs, that the analysis is done well, and that everybody discusses the conclusions and gets on board. Again, different stakeholders, uh, uh, government, energy sector stakeholders like utilities, uh, in some countries is one player, in some countries is uh, TSO, DSO, uh, regulator, uh, 
generators and, and so on, so it could be very diverse. And uh, of course, very important to coordinate the work with other partners that are active in the same country. And the idea is that you have a, a vision of how today's energy system is going to look like tomorrow, a shared vision. Uh, this is more in the space of what has been presented last time, which is more what I am focusing on nowadays, but essentially the idea is that uh, th there is a modeling framework behind these plans. It's not a, a very qualitative plan where we discuss a shared vision as, uh, as something very nice that everybody agrees with, but we're getting into the details. Uh, details meaning that essentially you have a, a linear programming or non-linear, but essentially you have an optimization problem to solve that tells you how your capacity for generation of electricity will evolve. We are trying to see how such a future system will operate, which is an interesting challenge nowadays, and then potentially resolve any grid-related issues with the work that has been discussed last time by my colleague Francisco. And then you get some quantitative insights, which is very important. Everybody has opinions, but uh, once you start talking about numbers, you start trying to get the opinions aligned with each other. If you're only talking about opinions, each one can live with its own opinion. So it's very important to have sound quantitative analysis to inform policy decisions. And this is what at the end the objective is, is to get good policies in place for deployment. We spoke about this a little bit before, small islands and big islands, very different pathways, very different issues. When you do a plan, you have to realize that very small systems could be transformed with one project. So you don't need to worry about the regulatory framework and how many investors you're going to get. You're just going to design a mini-grid with large shares of solar, battery system, and it's done. In a bigger system, it gets increasingly complex. It's really an energy transition. You need to have different steps. You need to have all the different layers in place. And so sometimes small is beautiful because it's easy. And uh, not always. You need to carry the batteries. But at the end, it's much easier to plan. Bigger system, much more complicated to, to build a proper plan for the transition. Three examples of plans. Just let me see how I'm doing with time. Three examples of plants on the small and the medium and on the large side. So, very small system. This is the main island in Kiribati. This is what you're doing essentially by bringing in solar, doing nothing to your operations. And you see this red is essentially wasted electricity that you cannot really dispatch, although your load is up here. And you do some additional analysis and you try to make sure that actually this can be used and so essentially there are some technical issues at the small scale that you need to solve already at the plan level because when you're talking a plan at such a small scale, well, it's really almost a single project, it's a few megawatt here. So essentially you go from today to tomorrow and you see a significant increase in renewables, significant increase in energy efficiency and the two things play very well together. More complicated is we're going from, let's say, 5 megawatt to 150 megawatt, which is already off the scale of the initial chart, about small and, and, and big. So this is, in theory, very big, but it's actually not very big. So you still have your diesel generators, you have something else in addition, you have some uh, more, let's say, difficult to manage units, such as steam units. But essentially, the idea is that there are a lot more variables that you need to take into account. It's not just a small project. There is a regulatory framework to take into account. There is a, a market design problem to be resolved once you want to bring in investors. The main idea is that you can look at all these different uh, scenarios for your future system, but your optimal system from today, which is essentially a little bit of solar on the rooftop of households and, and commercial, and uh, the rest is fuel oil, actually, not even diesel. The rest looks very renewable. There is a role for biomass, there is a role for wind and solar that is very significant, and there is a role for batteries to make sure the system keeps operating, which is illustrated here. And so what are we after when we do such complicated analysis? It's not to try to, to publish a paper and convince people that this is the way to do the analysis, it's to get something like this. So this is a statement from the Prime Minister of Barbados that essentially says, well, now that we've seen how this is going to work out, we got the confidence to actually open up the generation sector for renewable energy systems to be deployed, and so we are going to let the cabinet increase the allowances for new generators to come in and build solar and wind systems in the country. 
So you need to build the confidence that this is actually a reasonable plan, it works, and it can be achieved. Very large systems, we are working currently with colleagues from Dominican Republic, where our role is, is a much more complex system, much bigger system, one of the largest uh, small island developing states, if you wish, which is at the moment around two and a half gigawatt peak demand and heading to five in the next 15 years. Uh, challenges are different, there is a market, there are, there are regulations in place, and what we're trying to do is much more along the lines of the things that are discussed, say, for Germany. So, how do we optimize the intraday market, how do we look at uh, operations, how do we look at different locations for, for systems, how do we use renewables forecast, so this is a fully fledged, very complex type of, type of analysis. And so this should show that it's a little bit different from putting some solar and PV next to your diesel. And this is still an island and still called small island developing state, although it's 10 million people. Again, the point is that islands means many different things and you need to be listening very carefully to your counterparts when you work with them in trying to understand how can you add value. Grid studies was presented already last time, so I'm not going to have much detail, but it was important to, to put it into context. So in the flow of the different tools we have for islands, grid studies are very important. You have the roadmaps, you have the policies in place that say we want to go 50, 100 percent renewable. And then you have somebody that comes and says, no, the system will stop working, there will be problems, uh, and we cannot do it. So we come in and we try to work with the utilities and the government to see how you can actually do it. So you need to get really detailed here. And, and Francisco gave a flavor of that last time, but essentially we are starting looking frequency, voltage, and uh, stability, and, and I just leave it at that. This is really off topic, but it is, it's a very crucial component to make sure that the rest of the machine, which is institutional frameworks and financing of projects, actually work together to get you to implementation. If somebody stands up and says, you have to stop now because otherwise you're not going to have electricity anymore because the system will be unreliable, then people stop. And, and this is a key enabler for energy transition. Some of the issues, again, this has already been discussed, but the idea is that there are challenges, say, on system operation, grid capacity and stability, and for each of them there are solutions, but to devise serious solutions you need to do serious studies. And this is an example. So there is a very ambitious plan being put in place and being implemented, and during the implementation some issues started arising, and the question is how do we continue without stopping this energy transition? And so we came in, we did the study, and the result is that Solutions have been identified and uh, in the meanwhile even procured. So Tesla has been building a battery and that together with some other, let's say, other technical components into the system ensure that the transition can continue smoothly. Project facilitation. Uh, in the category of project facilitation we have a series of tools. I tried to give a flavor before of where they fit, but at the end they all fit into building equipment on the ground. You need to start from somewhere, which is essentially understanding where you're going to do your projects, understand how to develop a bankable project proposal. Once it's bankable, well, you need to still get it to a bank and get it financed. And then finally, you need to build it. So to a certain extent, the Arena IDFD facility can help in building, but you cannot build everything that is needed to be built for a complete energy transition, but this is demonstrating that this is working and this is working well. Few words about each of them. There will be a presentation on the navigator in the next one or the one after the next. So essentially the idea is that project developers in this case are the main beneficiaries. So typically project developers know how to do projects. In this case, we're just trying to build a how do you say, an accessible knowledge base for project developers to actually develop projects in different contexts. What to look at from A to Z to get to a bankable project proposal and then you can bring to a financing institution and get approved. Uh, one of the ways to, to make sure that this knowledge is indeed accessible is not just to have it into a very nice website, but actually is to go around the world and run workshops so that project developers can get involved. And of course, you cannot go everywhere and involve every project developer. That's why we also have webinars. So the idea is that there are 
4,500 registered users on the platform, of which 700 developers have been trained in person, 3,000 people through webinars, and users come from every country in the world. At the moment, 1,300 projects are being created on the platform, and seven technologies are already covered, including uh, having one that is not a project, but is a more island-specific module that looks at the specificities and challenges that I spoke about before. Uh, where do you locate your project? These maps might look familiar for some of you. This is typically GIS maps that look at solar radiation, wind, biomass, so we have it for pretty much all renewable energy resources. So if you want to do a solar project in a country or in a region, you might start from here to see where do you have resource. And then you go to the next level, it's like can I build a project and get the electricity to the power system at a reasonable distance, and so you start building additional GIS layers. Some of this can be already used by policymakers to do zoning work, or even get into a bit more detail for the islands we've been doing some, let's say, advisory service to do a site appraisal, so starting to look at specific locations and see how those could be used for generating renewable energy and get it to the grid. Finally, the last two steps, once you have a bankable project proposal for a brilliant solar or wind or biomass site somewhere in your country, then you might want to have somebody to finance at least part of it. So one way of looking at it is to put it up there into a platform where different partners, financial institutions typically, can come in, look at the projects and pick those that suit their criteria for financing. And that has been quite successful and it's been trying to bridge the gap between those that tell you that they have projects and those that tell you that they don't receive enough projects for the money they have to finance them. And uh, finally, uh, some of the projects have been directly financed with concessional uh, loans from uh, the Irina Abu Dhabi Fund for Development. Uh, now we are looking into uh, some of the additional areas of the world where projects have been collected. Africa has been the first, Caribbean the second, and we have more coming. And these are some of the projects that have actually been financed by the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development through this facility. We are reaching uh, the fifth cycle conclusion, so we're going to announce the winners of the fifth cycle at our assembly in January. And these are just some of the projects that have been financed around the world through the first four cycles of the facility. So we go from wind and hydro to geothermal to wind and solar to hybrid solar system, waste to energy, biomass, and so on and so forth. So we've been looking at a variety of technologies in a variety of places. Many of those are indeed islands because it's where a need for financing has been identified as quite severe. And with this I get to the end of my presentation, just a little bit uh, highlighting a couple of points about this COP and, and the link with islands. So Fiji is for the first time a small island developing state being the president of the COP. Germany is uh, helping to host the COP. And uh, as you know, we have indeed a bond zone and a bula zone. And in the bond zone at the Irina Pavilion, we will have a full day dedicated to renewable energy in small island developing states from morning to evening concluded with a high-level event uh, at the Kunstmuseum that goes for people that have access to the Bula Zone, uh, sorry, to the Bonn Zone, which is the one in the Rheinauer. So at our pavilion we will have a discussion on some of these topics for a whole day on Monday. And with this one, I hope you would have many questions. Thank you. Everything clear? I can speak another half an hour if you like. Yes, please. You said that the good faith that the islands are good laboratory for all the things, but you explained that there are a lot of things that are specifically for islands. So, aren't uh, there from this, I would conclude that islands are not a good laboratory for <laughs> bigger countries. 
It depends what you mean by laboratory. So my, my view of laboratory is something where you can test things into a control environment and try to have a replicable experiment. I'm not arguing that if you build a 50 kilowatt solar battery mini grid, then tomorrow you can apply that to Europe. What I'm saying is that you're showing that a system without a rotating mass can generate electricity without any problem with actually better quality. Other things that have been tested today, for instance, not in islands, but that could be very relevant for this, uh, this uh, conceptual problems we have is, for instance, we say solar really creates only problem to the grid. It really cannot help in doing anything to make it work better. Well, in the US, they tested a 300 megawatt solar facility, so a very large one, and they've been proving that in every single grid service you can think about, they've been outperforming thermal generators. So the islands have the opportunity of saying, well, I'm running American Samoa, the whole island, on 90 plus percent solar and battery, it works, and this is relatively small for the energy transition as a whole, but this is showing it works, and, and showing it works goes a very long way. It doesn't get you to, to apply to Europe tomorrow, but it, for instance, works very well to apply into university campuses that want to have reliable service, or to hospitals and schools, and you're starting seeing, because of the compelling economics of solar plus batteries, that it starts making sense to actually go away from the grid. It's all about economics. You can say that it doesn't work because you have in mind that solar and batteries are expensive. But if it's happening, it's not really true that it's that expensive. In Australia, it's already breaking even. It's much cheaper to get off from the grid and build your solar plus battery for your home today. And this is small scale systems. For islands, has been true for quite some time, and while this has been deployed, technology costs kept going down. So they are an excellent, excellent laboratory because you can start getting to very high shares of solar and wind, which are the more difficult ones. Hydro, large shares have always been there. Geothermal as well. So you have Costa Rica has been mostly 100% renewable last year. Hydro, uh, Iceland used to be 100% geothermal. Now they're 100% geothermal plus hydro. This has been around for a century. We're talking about solar and wind in islands today. Well, there are islands that are close to 100% solar or wind power today. So we're just showing that this can happen not only with hydro and geothermal, but also with solar and wind. And if you have a country that comes to COP and says, my country is going 100% and I know how, and somebody already did it, it goes a long way. Hello. Um, you showed us Irene as tools for helping small island developing states, but I didn't see any tools that specifically related to community renewable energy projects. Um, would you say that Irene's emphasis is more on deployment of technology rather than empowering the people with ownership of their own energy? Maybe you could just paint us a picture of what community energy looks like on some of these small islands. That's a very good question. So, Irina is... Uh, so when we say Irina, we mean some, sometimes 153 countries. So Irina is 153 countries, and myself and my colleagues are the secretariat for these 153 countries for a specific purpose, which is accelerating deployment of renewables around the world. So how do we do that? In theory, we try to do it at all levels. So when you say community energy, I can think about some of the work that has been done, for instance, to get the, the view of the communities into the national energy policy process to what we call the renewable readiness assessment. So trying to make sure that all the stakeholders are represented in the policy making process. Of course, we don't focus on, on building systems on the ground because we are 150 people in the secretariat that would take a lot of manpower to build all this gigawatt of solar. Uh, what we're trying to do is to make sure that, that the, the way for uh, renewables is clear from uh, unfair barriers and the way to do that is to also work at the community level. Uh, we cannot work in every community but we try to make sure that the, the concerns of the communities get reflected into the national energy policy making. And another angle of it is that we've been running some work with, uh, for instance, entrepreneurship 
facilities. So trying to build the capacity to become a renewable energy entrepreneur in some areas. So there's been some work done last year in, in uh, I think, southern Africa, and it's now moving around the continent. Again, you cannot reach out to everyone, but the idea is that then this, this knowledge is built and is made available to everybody. And another angle could be, for instance, with, through the project navigator. So typically there, you could have small-scale entrepreneurs that look at how to get a project to a financing institution, which not having a big company at the back with expertise in project development could be a big challenge, but you have solar home system modules in there. So you can think about a community using the navigator to build a solar home system pro program for their community and try to see if they can find some financing for that and actually there is financing even for these small scale projects. We don't provide it but we suggest where you can look for it. Okay. And then if it's all clear, anything else you can always send us an email. So, thank you very much for your attention.